I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Eric Seibel. He's a research professor of mechanical engineering and director of the Human Photonics Lab at the University of Washington. And he will be telling us about uh, how optical methods can be used for imaging, diagnostics, therapy, and monitoring in organs such as lung and pancreas with uh, scanning, fiber endoscopy, multimodes of guided intervention. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Over the last decade, the goal has been ultra-thin, wide field, high resolution endoscopy. And that goal was uh, essentially achieved and is being achieved now at the University of Washington and other, other places. Uh, two years ago, we brought our system into the University of Washington Medical Center, and there we were doing the first human imaging of a bile duct for image-guided biopsy. And biliary cancer has really almost like a 2 to 3% survival rate, so it's really important to get high-resolution imaging on that. And I'll never forget what happened the first time the images came up, and that is immediately the nurses whipped out their cell phones and started calling everybody else to come in and see these high-resolution res images of the uh, bile duct that they had never seen before. And this is a very weak laser pointer, but this is the bile duct imaging with the scanning fiber endoscope. And these, that's the cystic duct there for the gallbladder, and that's the main duct. And so that would be right up in that area there. And what they were used to is these images here. And I made them smaller so they'd look better for Boston Scientific, who, who kindly donated this video for me. Um, and it's very hard to see uh, the, the mucosa, the epithelial here, for early uh, cancer diagnosis. Now, to be fair, this patient just had the uh, black sludge and stones removed, and that's why you have that high contrast, and that's why I picked this video, because you have higher contrast on the wall. Um, but the coherent fiber bundle technology, it's been around for a long time, and it is the mainstay for these very, very small ducts. But it only has about 100 pixels across uh, the resolution, whereas this is about 500 uh, lines across. And um, it's good for seeing that your biopsy forceps are in front of you and maybe seeing a little blood when you can grab hold of the tissue and destroy those boulders in front of you, which are the stones. Um, but really, you are legally blind when you are, when you're, um, when you're using that scope. You're actually three times the legal blindness. And so uh, it's, a, it's an issue for when we're trying to do more sophisticated um, uh, procedures in small ducts. And so how the scanning fiber endoscope works and produces high resolution is shown here. And in this case, I'm going to start from the left to the right um, and uh, the laser pointer here. And what we do is we put red, green, blue lasers combined into a single mode optical fiber. That single mode optical fiber goes into a piezo scanner, and that scans at about 11 to 13 kilohertz at the resonant frequency of this quartz cantilever. And that quartz cantilever then moves from a base of a few microns to about th plus or minus 300 microns, and that scans a wide field of view through the lens system. And because this is a single mode optical fiber, it's like a point source. And, at the, and so it produces a Gaussian spot. And you could say, as a, order magnet, or as a rule of thumb, wavelength over NA. In order to get this wide field of view, 70, 80, up to 100 degrees field of view, we have a very low NA, and we have then what doctors would, for endoscopists, call high resolution, but you might call low resolution. But the advantage here is we have very long depth of focus because the field of view is expanding out as well as this collimated beam. 
a, a semi-collimated beam and expanding out. And so we get very long depth of focus, and then you can go in and really see the tools in front of the scope. So this scanning is done in a spiral pattern, and it's just shown here three out of now we up to 600 lines or 300 um, expanding spirals. And the interesting thing is we turn on and off this resonant scanner 30 times a second to, to run at video rates. Then the back scatter comes back, and you could just take one collection of optical fiber. Here there's um, a ring of fibers around it. Or you could actually have a sensor here, and you, you're detecting the images at 20, 40 megahertz. So this is the family of scanning fiber endoscope uh, on the in vivo end. And the in vivo end ranges from 1.2 millimeters, which with about an 8 to 9 millimeter rigid tip length, to a 6.5 millimeter uh, capsule. To give you a scaling, this open lens aperture is about the same for each of the devices. And this is ongoing in, in many uh, clinical tests. And I'm going to explain um, how we're doing now our guided interventions. It's very simple. We actually adopted the, the nice system that, similar to the um, Boston Scientific, where we have a tube that holds forceps, our scanning fiber endoscope. There's plenty of flushing here in and out, so we can uh, clear the bile duct and, and other areas. Um, we've also put in uh, electromagnetic sensors for guided uh, navigation to uh, lesions in uh, living pigs. And we've also um, put in a um, little ro robotic system to do a panorama image inside the bladder. So these are other techniques. But what is really exciting now is applications that are here and now waiting for this technology. And that is looking in the cardiovascular system for using of the tools, because there the tool development is, is quite far along. And so in that particular case, you put, it, you put the scanning fiber endoscope with whatever cardiovascular tool. You have a, often a balloon as well as a saline to clear the blood. There we go. So in this particular case, we're imaging a microwire that is steerable, and it's picking between different, um, different arterial or arterial branches of a pig, live pig kidney. And this is in collaboration with the winner of the SPIE uh, the award, uh, Brian Wilson, and his group up in Toronto. And so this allows you to place your cardiovascular tool and device without errors. And if you can see here, this was on purpose. Uh, one of the wires was going in into the endothelium and resulting in this, this is called mild uh, uh, reactions of the endothelium. And the black is the, is the true vessel and the white is the false lumen. And in this particular case, this was not visible on fluoroscopy. So x-ray fluoroscopy would not have picked this up. So this would be an excellent way for training of doctors and for speeding up procedures in, in the cardiovascular space. So this was the very first image in live pigs, and it's the highest resolution angioscopic image that had ever been seen by this cardiovascular group up in Toronto. So the next images are the most impressive. So for these Canadians, I, ho I hope you can give a little awe when you, when you see the, the images. This is a stent opening on the left. And this is uh, now speeded up just a little bit. And on the right, is a placement of coils. And this is, uh, again, with the 1.2 millimeter scope, it is, uh, you're able to see at this high resolution, you're able to see 
the extent of the stent, where the stent was being placed, and actually how well it's seated against the, uh, the endothelium. So move on to the next, and this is now the list. Now this is using more of the color imaging to look at a, uh, the thrombi that has been captured after a artificial uh, clot was produced in a live pig. And this is um, just another example, and this is a list of the, of the applications that this new technology might bring. And there's one more that's missing here, and that is the looking at vulnerable plaques. And there's a color analysis, there's fluorescence analysis, and things like that. And those will be, in the future, applications. And, the, and what, what we're doing now is we're building these multi-fluorescent, uh, multi-spectral fluorescent scopes. This is one that's producing red, green, and blue fluorescence along with a grayscale to give you the anatomical detail as well as it, it gives you a distance compensation. There's no changes with the scanning fiber endoscopes in vivo and, and this is for the um, application of multi-molecular um, multi, uh, probes at one time to increase this sensitivity, which is only moderate when you use one biomarker with fluorescein. So we expect to Im improve this, and this is how we hope to make some improvements in the GI tract for early cancer diagnosis and reducing the mortality rate. This is with the University of Washington, uh, I mean, University of Michigan, Tom Wang's group. And what we're able to also do with this multispectral is we can image the autofluorescence in the blue channel, we can image the fluorescein in the green channel, we can subtract that autofluorescence in live video and really improve the, the utility of fluorescein, which is the easiest dye to be uh, FDA approved and it has the highest quantum efficiencies. The last application is the laser scanner scans here, and in the center you can actually wait for about five milliseconds and you can do optical spot biopsy. We're currently doing that in uh, a dental application where we actually analyze the lesions of teeth and, but after we image it. So in conclusion, the ultra-thin, uh, wide-field, high-resolution endoscope has many of these uh, future uh, interventions and it provides the forward view that you need with long depth of focus and with the laser based system you have the fluorescence and you have other types of laser based diagnostics and I've already thanked uh, my collaborators in Toronto and Ann Arbor and of course this was funded by uh, three uh, grants from NIH thank you for your attention okay.